So today, um, I just want to introduce you to our panelists. Um, first of all, um, from from my, my all the way from the left, uh, Clara Sal. She is our moderator for today. She is the Chief Technology Officer for the CVE Task Force at the Department of Homeland Security, and she is also a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow. Uh, we also have Kevin Adams um, who, uh, from Justice and Home Affairs from the British Embassy. Dr. Alex Hitchens, Research Director uh, from the Project on Extremism from George Washington University. Mark McCarthy, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the Software and Information Industry Association. And Arthur Reiser, Director of National Security and Justice Policy at R Street. And you can also follow all of them on Twitter as well as we have their uh, usernames on uh, your handout. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Clara to begin. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, so before we start off, um, I wanted a raise of hands here to see who, who knows the definition of CVE. So we have maybe three hands in the room. So CVE can mean a number of different things. In government, we love to use acronyms. Um, in the cybersecurity space, CVE can also mean common vulnerabilities and exposures. That is not what we're talking about today. Um, in today's context, we're, we're explaining countering violent extremism and what is happening in the online space. Um, so before we kick off with the panel, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of history of CVE in U.S. government. Um, so the U.S. government back in 2011 created its first strategy on countering violent extremism um, in the 2011 Strategic Implementation Plan. Historically, government has really played in this space by empowering local partners, and that's been its approach to date. Um, in 2016, uh, the U.S. government uh, enacted uh, and convened by the White House created the CVE Task Force, which was the first time the U.S. government uh, decided let's bring every single expert in this space from every entity in U.S. government focused on this field into one room, one office together. And so within this office, we have representatives from the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, FBI, Department of Justice, and uh, finally, uh, uh, Homeland Security. And so um, under the 2011 SIP, Section 3.3, there is a section where um, it's primarily focused on how are we tackling the issue of online radicaliz radicalization and what kind of technologies can we use to really make um, effective progress in this space. Um, so I'm going to first kick it off um, more from the research side to Dr. Alexander Hitchens, um, who's going to give us a brief overview of what is happening online, um, why are people being radicalized, um, and what the research community has been doing about it. Yes, yeah, so I think I'll do as quick as I can a sort of uh, quick history of, of extremist and terrorist use of, of the internet up to where we are today. Um, and leave some open questions about both what we can do about it and, and the kind of obstacles that may be very difficult to overcome. Um, so if we go right back to the kind of mid to late 90s, this, this began as essentially static websites, uh, controlled and f founded by uh, standard terrorist organizations from the kind of uh, early years of AQ, and they were sort of top down. They were controlled. Um, and there were one-way streets. You, you post uh, the latest pronouncements, the latest um, ideas, and, and the latest uh, uh, campaigns, and people would be able to uh, uh, you know, look at it and read it. And um, essentially, that was, that was how it, it looked. And that's kind of essentially how the internet looked, of course. But as the internet itself evolved, so did uh, terrorist use of it, often very much at the forefront of it, in fact, um, figuring out what the latest innovations were and taking great advantage of it. Um, around the sort of mid part of the last decade, uh, around the same time of the Iraq War, you had this explosion in uh, the use of uh, forums, so the standard kind of uh, discussion forums. Um, these were, again, top down in a sense. There was groups like Al-Qaeda and now others uh, with the franchises that were developing at the time, de uh, setting up their own forums. But they were also uh, bottom-up and grassroots. There were supporters setting up uh, their own forums now and becoming more involved. And also it added a new element to this, which was a sort of two-way, uh, more interactive uh, element. Now, people felt they could be part of a community, part of a network, uh, discuss these ideas amongst each other, and could feel more uh, plugged in. And so that was the kind of next major uh, step. And then we had, in the sort of 
really last few years, um, so-called Web 2.0 and, and social media. Um, and this kind of changed the game in a couple of very important ways. Um, if we were to take, uh, for example, uh, Twitter, which is the kind of the often uh, mentioned, uh, you know, favored favored platform of, of ISIS today. Um, it added a couple more features to it. Now it was yet even more interactive. It increased that interactivity. Um, it allowed for very easy uh, propaganda uh, dissemination, um, and it did a couple things that were quite unique to what social media can do for you. So if you were to take how you radicalize, if you're, if you're a recruiter um, in the so-called, in the physical world, if we take it off, uh, off, offline for a second, there's a couple things you need to do to uh, recruit people and radicalize them, or at least radicalize and then recruit them. Um, generally, you need to take them away from their previous surroundings, isolate them away from uh, their previous life, um, and place them in a sort of echo chamber of sorts, um, where all they hear and all they, they talk about are the ideas of, of the group that you're in question. Um, and you cut them away from any sort of dissenting voices, and you, you drown out debate and any sort of uh, um, disagreement. And so, and in that same time, you put them in touch and you, and you, and you put them in together, again, in the physical world here, with like-minded individuals. So all they're talking about is the ideas of, of this specific group, drowning out everything else. Um, so if we were to talk about how um, this is relevant today to the social media space, um, essentially what, what social media is doing is, is, is a lot of the same kind of thing. So um, as you, if you use Twitter, you notice quite soon that it figures out what you like uh, on your feed, and it tells you what you want to hear. It provides you information about what you like and what you want to hear. And you generally won't hear much of the opposite. Um, so if you take it to, if you like a certain sports team, you're going to be hearing uh, very soon. It's going to figure that out, and it's going to be telling you all about that team, and not much about the rivals, for example. Um, not only then is it, is it tailoring itself and, and what you see every day to what it has figured out what you want to hear, and largely drowned out the, the opposing positions, um, it also, in that little sidebar often, tells you who, who else thinks like you um, and who perhaps you might want to be friends with and talk to. So it's doing all the things that really were able, uh, recruiters and radicalizers did uh, in the real world and still do today. It places you in this echo chamber. It, it surrounds you with people who, who have uh, the same views, plugs you into networks of like-minded individuals. And this is a kind of fundamental issue that I'm, you know, this is not even a criticism really of social media. This is just the byproduct. You know, this is a good, you know, this is, a, this is why we like it. It tailors itself to our interests. But this is why it's also very effective uh, for extremist recruiters. And I'm not too sure a huge amount can be done about that. Um, and, and this kind of takes me on to my final point in this evolution, which is um, the increase in, in uh, encrypted technology and encrypted messaging. So if we were to look at, at this, this Twitter problem that I've just mentioned, um, you start hearing all the news you like, and you start plugging yourself into a network of like-minded individuals. Eventually, and you could do this yourself, frankly, if you tried uh, hard enough, um, before you know it, especially in the last couple, uh, couple years ago, um, once you're in that network and you start following all the right people and they start following you back, sooner or later, um, you usually are going to come across someone who's the real deal, someone who is an actual IS member, who is in IS territory, in fact. Um, and these are people who often have built up major reputations um, as being guys who are walking the walk and, uh, as well as talking. Uh, they are there, they're fighting, they're doing all the, the stuff they keep talking about online, and, and they're known, and they have a number of different handles. They, they, they have, let's say, probably dozens, in fact. Um, and so you often come across these guys, and they're and the research that we've done at my center has looked at them, and we've called them virtual entrepreneurs. They've also been called virtual pl plotters. These are guys who are, as I said, in IS territory, who are getting in touch with people, usually through, originally through that Twitter uh, or other social media network. Um, and eventually, uh, once they, that conversation begins on Twitter, uh, moves to maybe Twitter direct message, um, once a sort of basic vetting process and somewhat of a grooming process has taken place, they will then move them on to uh, encrypted platforms. So they will say, you know, let's take this conversation somewhere where people really can't see it. Um, and at the moment, those are a number of uh, different platforms. A very popular for a time was a chat messenger called Kick. Um, now, uh, Telegram, you may have heard of, 
another encrypted application, and also uh, WhatsApp, of course, that we, most of us probably in this room use today is, is, is an encrypted application as well. Um, and they will say, you know, they will take that conversation uh, to the encrypted chat and we'll, where, where they will have more specific discussions about uh, ideas as well as about plans uh, for, you know, terrorist uh, plots. So if we were to, in our research, we looked at um, around uh, 38 total plots between March 2014 and March 2017. Uh, that's 38 plots in the United States, so 38 IS-related uh, terrorist plots, domestic terrorist plots. We found that around, and we think the number is higher, but the confirmed number was eight of those, so 21 percent were individuals who were uh, directed by these virtual entrepreneurs, these guys who are in, for a time they were in Raqqa, they may still uh, be there, um, the ones who are still alive. Um, and they had given them specific instructions on how and what uh, to do in order to carry out an attack for IS. And so you, what you do, what this allows for them to do is to take these kind of zealous kids who are here who want to do something but have no real training, don't really have the, the ability to think of a, a sort of good tactic or good strategy for an attack, and they kind of can hone that desire and say, you know, don't go do something like rush an armed police officer because you'll probably just get shot before you achieve anything. Um, you know, go, go for these soft targets, you know, trying to sort of redirect their attentions to something that might actually work. Um, so this is a, a kind of where we are today in the West um, on, in terms of the, the sort of use of the Internet. And in Europe, again, 38 plots in the same period of time, 50 percent online instruction from another study uh, uh, done by a guy called Peter Nestor and a couple of other authors. Um, so these are the kind of fundamental issues that are going to be tough to do much about. One, change the very nature of social media, tough. Two, get rid or give access to encrypted uh, technology, very, very tough, and maybe not necessarily desirable. Um, so the kind of open questions I'll, le I'll, leave, I'll leave to you um, will be, you know, how much do we want to change about the internet uh, in order to stop what is actually a very difficult thing to do, to do a huge amount about. More can be done, but I think that we have to accept the limits as well, and I'm happy to discuss those further as the conversation uh, evolves. And I'll leave thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Um, I mean, so, sorry. And, and so now we're going to move over to um, Arthur. Um, so Arthur, aside from being a law professor and also now a director of a think tank, uh, he also spent some time on the ground in Falufa, um, really seeing the, the issue face front. So um, Arthur, can you um, maybe give us a quick brief overview of why, why people are turning um, to the internet to radicalize and, and what you've seen in your time? Yeah, I think it's uh, highlight one thing that was just said is what's so unique about this is that there never before has an organization with no footprint in a particular area been able to recruit lone wolves. You highlighted that uh, precisely, and I think the history of ISIS, uh, ISIL, uh, is important to kind of the, the, the landscape. Uh, who are we talking about? What are we talking about? So, as, as you know, mentioned, a, a soldier in the United States Army, I retired a couple years ago um, after 20 years in the reserves and active duty, and my big URA um, uh, movement was uh, in Fallujah. So I spent 450 days in Fallujah with the uh, Marine Corps. I'm an Army guy, but I was with the Marines. And my job was to train the Iraqi Army to fight the insurgency. Well, at the time, the insurgency in uh, was Al Qaeda in Iraq. Now, Al Qaeda in Iraq is really important to the discussion because Al Qaeda uh, already had a lot of tools on recruitment, um, but mostly Al Qaeda was recruiting tool, uh, recruiting individuals. Much like um, the good doctor just kind of mentioned, they would they would uh, use classic type of radicalization procedures where they would isolate somebody. They would um, you know use different types of uh, psychology and 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 mind uh, games in order to to pull somebody in the echo chamber, as you will. Um, so they, they learned how to kind of perfect this. As the, the surge and what, we, what I call the awakening, um, the Sunni awakening, um, excuse me, awakening in Al Ambar province, particularly happened in Iraq around 2005, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq was kind of crushed. And then their leader, Al Qazari, I mean, everybody's kind of heard his name before. Um, uh, you know, Americans think he's a lot bigger deal than. Uh, than he actually was, but after he died, the movement kind of died 
with him and the awakening of the Shia, uh, they started to kind of fight and um, fight off al-Qaeda in Iraq. So this organization kind of went into hibernation. And it was at that point that you really saw the formation of, of ISIS. What we saw was the, the Shia um, uh, political movement oppressed the Sunni political movement. And that was just great you know, feeder for radicalization. People felt oppressed. People felt um, they had no voice. And there was already tension with the Kurds up north. And so we, we, we saw the groundwork for this type of radicalization. And something that's really important about ISIL, and I actually interrogated members of al-Qaeda, um, uh, 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 you know, al-Qaeda of Iraq. And one thing that I, I, I found so unique, um, different from the other insurgents that we encountered, where most of them were kind of quasi-middle class individuals from Jordan. Um, Al-Khazari was from, from, from Jordan. And they had a lot of contact already with U.S. They liked American TV shows. Um, they would ask us for movies, American movies. They didn't want, they didn't want any, uh, they called them crap movies, no crap movies. They wanted American movies. Um, you know, they, Batman Begins was really popular with, um, uh, with terrorists when I was in Iraq. And when we would catch I remember, I remember sitting down and talking to an individual, and one of my Iraqi officers said, oh, he's very wealthy, he's from Jordan. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing here, man? He's like, I'm on vacation. I said, who in the hell goes on vacation to Fallujah? He said, I came here to kill Americans. That's what he said. I came here to kill Americans. And that was shocking to me that he was just so point blank. You know, I came here to kill Americans. Um, and I mean, his opinion was that I came there to kill Muslims. Um, that wasn't true, but that's what his opinion was. So it, it is important of ISIS were actually captured at some point in Iraq, served time in U.S. Uh, detention in Iraq, um, interacted a lot with American GIs. They understand us a lot more than we think they do. Uh, and they were released. So understanding that kind of backdrop of ISIS and why they had turned to the internet, because they're sophisticated. They, have, they understand that this is a, 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 a way to recruit the lone wolf, um, as you, you know, per se, uh, it is important, I think, for the overall discussion. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, and so if you guys have not been following in recent news, there's been a lot of commotion happening on the other side of the pond in the UK. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin um, from the British Embassy to really talk about um, the recent news and events there and how they've been working with the technology sector uh, to really look at this issue in the online space. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I certainly kind of recognize what uh, Alex was talking about. And um, perhaps it's helpful to say a little bit more specific, if you like, what we're seeing in the UK right now. Um, now, obviously, there is, uh, Clara, you started talking about uh, CVE. I mean, we don't call it that in the UK. We talk about a prevent program, preventing terrorism and countering extremism, and extremism in all its forms. But uh, let me focus on the sort of online piece, which is what we're here today. So, I mean, essentially in the UK, unfortunately, like uh, lots of other places, vulnerable people are being radicalized and recruited online. Um, as ISIL uh, has been losing uh, ground in Syria and Iraq, um, I mean, broadly we've seen they've stopped calling for fighters to come to build the caliphate and instead using online propaganda to persuade people to stay in their communities and commit uh, acts of terror at home. Um, so, really, Daesh is actually using the internet to sort of weaponize people in our own communities. And unfortunately, recent events in the UK, and I'm sure um, many of you will have seen uh, the attacks at Westminster Bridge, at the Manchester Arena, at London Bridge, and at Finsbury Park Mosque. Um, I mean, these show, them, fortunately, that they're having some success. Um, the Westminster Bridge attacker, for example, was, was inspired by the works of Amor Awalaki, which are still you know, very freely available online. Um, we've seen recent disruptions of terrorist plots um, have shown uh, actually of individuals that appear to have been radicalized almost exclusively online. And of course, these are plots that in many cases are the hardest ones to disrupt for the reasons uh, Alex mentioned. So the UK government, uh, we, have a, we have a big program of work, but certainly a very important part of that is to try and make the internet a, a more hostile space for terrorists to operate in. 
And we think we're having some success in this. Um, we certainly, uh, with you know, coalition partners, degraded ISIL's technical and physical infrastructure so that their output is declining. Uh, since September last year, a very robust multi-platform approach uh, to removing online terrorist content has resulted in a real team which um, ISIL propaganda is available online. So from, I think, last September, uh, terrorist content was online for an average of 32 days. That is now between one and three days before, before it's taken down. But really huge challenges still remain. There's a, there's a large body of propaganda online which uh, Daesh supporters are able to upload and disseminate links to. Um, and three quarters of links to Daesh propaganda are shared within the first three hours of it being released. So even taking it down very quickly doesn't, um, doesn't solve the problem because a lot of the damage is done so quickly. I mean, we know that Daesh is extremely media savvy and places a huge priority on its media operations. Um, they encourage their supporters to, for example, change their geographical location to give the impression trends of threats in specific countries. So, you know, they're sophisticated and they know what they're doing. And we also know that the, the big tech companies are important, the sort of household name tech companies are important in this. For example, I saw messages posted in um, sort of Telegram uh, consistently emphasize the need and call on their supporters to continue outreach on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and other major platforms. And they take pride in their, in their sort of place on the open internet. Uh, for example, Islamic State Media is, is available, is spread in more than 40 languages today. Um, there's nearly eight, over 18,000 posts each day related to Islamic State on social media websites and more than 1,000 new accounts made by supporters each day uh, on Twitter. So this is why the UK, we strongly welcome the recent announcement by, uh, by industry, by Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube and Twitter on their intention to um, create a global internet forum to counter terrorism. And we've seen that there is a, um, a sort of increasing, I think, call from the international community for, for a body like this to, to do more. For example, the, uh, the G7 recently uh, put out a strong statement encouraging this, as did um, a meeting of Five Eyes, which is sort of UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, who met in Ottawa recently. So uh, we really want to work closely with, with the companies to help ensure that this forum represents a really important step change in, in their efforts to tackle terrorist and violent extremist use of the internet. Um, I mean, we do a lot nationally in the UK. We have a, an internet referrals unit that has, a, has developed strong relationships with, with lots of companies um, and since 2010 has secured the removal of a lot of terrorist material, over 270,000 pieces. Um, however, what we really want to see and what this forum thing really offers an opportunity is for the, the companies to do more uh, themselves by proactively identifying terrorist material and, and perhaps more importantly identifying using the latest technologies to prevent it being uh, in the first place. Um, so this is part of a, part of a you know, broader program of work but I think the, uh, this industry-led forum which is able to draw on the sort of ingenuity and resources of that industry uh, potentially can make a really big difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so to add to Kevin's point on um, really how uh, these groups have been leveraging online, we've seen um, ISIS put out Android applications. They have a GitHub account. Um, really being able to repli replicate bots at an immense speed, um, despite you know the amount of effort that has been um, ongoing to take down a lot of these messages. Um, so Mark is um, you know with us from the software and industries, uh, the software and information uh, industry association. Sticky words there. <laughs> and he's really going to share a little bit more in perspective about uh, what the tech companies have been doing across the board, um, what's been working, what's been not. We clearly have too many vowels in our name. Uh, we, we have to simplify somehow. Um, so uh, thanks for having me for, uh, at this event. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Congressional um, Advisory Group uh, for the Congressional Internet Caucus is, uh, is one of the groups we like to spend a lot of time working with. And I think this topic is a, is a crucial one, an important one. And the, this panel really has focused on the important thing, which is, um, w what are the efforts that, that can be made jointly between industry, government, uh, 
NGOs, third parties, academics, uh, civil liberties groups to address this, this problem, which um, I think we all recognize. I, I want to say something, something uh, right up front, which um, may, may annoy my, uh, my civil liberties friends. Um, the, the, um, uh, there is a perspective in the, in the sort of uh, civil liberties and First Amendment community that says, what's the point of taking stuff down? I mean, we, we, uh, you know, we, we believe in speech, and the best answer to, to speech is more speech. And if you suppress things, then it'll just go underground and do more damage. I mean, that, that's a real perspective in that community. And uh, I, I don't want to give it short shrift. It's got a long history, uh, going back to John Stuart Mill and other philosophers. Um, but um, I think the, the alternative perspective has, has basically been adopted by, by governments uh, and by the technology community as well, which is that some material um, has to be suppressed. I mean, think, think about hate speech, for example. Um, it, we may not want to have government laws against that, but, but that, that speech that's designed to make people unwelcome in their own communities. It's designed to say to, to discrete groups of people, you don't belong here. And if you stay here, we're going to treat you like a second-class citizen. Uh, you know, we, we, we really don't want that. And, and many of the technology uh, groups that create online spaces want them to be welcoming to everyone. Um, now, uh, you, you, look at, you look at what's going on in the, in the uh, terrorist um, recruitment uh, issue, and, and uh, the, the, the Internet company's approach is not to say, let's keep that stuff up there and create counter speech. That is part of what they're doing, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, but the initial step is to, is to work with as many groups as they possibly can uh, to identify the harmful material uh, and to take it down as fast as possible. They rely largely on reports of, of problems, not completely, and I'll get to that in a second, but largely. Um, uh, someone reports something, uh, if they're from one of the trusted uh, flagger groups, it gets very high priority uh, because the companies have learned that people from those groups who report problems are almost always right. Uh, so that goes to the top of the line and, co and comes down very, very quickly. Uh, government is among that, but NGOs are in that group as, uh, as well. Um, once you've identified bad material, um, uh, technology can, can help to make sure it doesn't get posted again. You, you can create a digital fingerprint of the offending material, and when someone tries to put that up again, you look at it and say, yeah, we already looked at that. That's a problem. It's not going up. So you can block material that has previously been identified uh, as, uh, as a problem. Um, and that then can be shared. One of the things that uh, the, the Global Internet Forum is doing is to share previously identified bad material so that all groups uh, who run these online platforms uh, can benefit from the information that any one of them has already developed. Um, so that's the first thing. Take down uh, as much of the bad stuff as, as you can find. Uh, use technology to uh, try to identify the material that's already uh, been identified. Um, and I'm glad Kevin you know, acknowledges the important work that that global internet forum is, is doing. Um, but the people who say the problem really is more speech have a point as well. Um, and so uh, one of the secondary things that the uh, technology companies are doing is to, uh, is to find uh, alternative counter-narratives, working with NGOs, working with governments, and, and trying to make sure that that's the material that's put in place uh, of people who are online and looking to get radicalized. You know, so instead of finding the stuff that they may be looking for, what they find instead are links to material that would give them a different story. It would say to them, Maybe you're looking for something that will respond to your sense of marginalization and alienation and anger, but take a look at this stuff instead. This, this may teach you a little bit more about what alternatives are really available. Um, and uh, just, just the other day, uh, YouTube announced uh, their, uh, uh, their redirect program where for certain keywords that are typed in uh, to YouTube, um, uh, instead of taking you to the, the terrorist content, it will take you to this range of alternative views. Um, and, and then the third um, element that the companies are working on uh, is, um, is partnerships. They can't do this alone. Um, uh, just, just like in, in fake news, they, they, they can't be the arbiters of truth. They work with third parties to verify whether a piece of um, alleged real news is really fake news. 
Uh, they need the third party vi verifiers in that circumstance. They need help from the third parties uh, to, um, to flag the offending content. They need help from the NGOs and the governments and other parties uh, to make sure that the content that is constructed for counter narratives is effective and sensitive to the needs involved. Um, they can't do that themselves. Uh, just like they're not journalists, they're, they're not skilled and expert in, uh, in those kind of um, uh, anti-terrorist messaging. So those are the three things uh, that they're doing. Um, uh, one last comment. Uh, th this is really a whole of society problem. Uh, there, there, there's some suggestions, and, and you hear it sometimes in the way people talk quickly about this issue. You know, if only the internet companies would do what they needed to do, the problem would go away. Uh, well, it's not going to go away. It, it wasn't caused by internet companies. It wasn't caused by communications technology. Um, we, we, we heard Arthur's good discussion of what it felt like to be in the middle of a conversation uh, with some of these groups, and they didn't become radicalized because of social networks and because of the internet. Um, and, and no matter what happens on the internet, the social, economic, and political problems that created these difficulties won't go away because of what the internet companies are doing. It's a whole of society problem. Governments have to be active, uh, civil society has to be active, everyone has to be active in this one um, to take steps that will really solve the problem. Uh, the technology companies have to do their part. There's no reason why they should amplify uh, these messages and, and create uh, the opportunity for this to spread beyond where it should go, um, but they can't solve the problem all by themselves either. No, that's a great point, and I, I wanted to add to Matt's, uh, to Mark's last point there about uh, the importance of third parties. So um, on the domestic side, we've been working very closely with all of our major uh, technology partners from the private industry, but if you can imagine every major platform and when an a piece of extremist content goes online. A lot of this content is hosted on third-party sites. Um, if you have ever illegally streamed any movie, um, <laughs> you'll know that a lot of these file sharing sites are probably uh, owned by um, a small company of three or four people. Um, and for them to ask to moderate is, is incredibly hard. Um, so I, I thought that was a really interesting point is, is really in collaboration. Um, to transition more into um, what uh, the U.S. government has been doing to date, um, we've been focused primarily on counter-messaging um, and empowering our local partners to be able to have the right tools to be able to do this effectively. Um, so uh, some of the recent successes, um, we have Susan in the room from our, from our team um, who runs um, and partners of the program called Peer to Peer. Um, we just had a domestic and national competition um, where through the use of students, there's around 500 student groups to date that have participated, um, where we've reached a span of 75 million people online in counter messaging that students have created to really tackle extremist issues in their, their own communities. Um, so um, I guess this is a question really for the panel. Um, one of the challenges um, in online content is um, as there are more uh, structure and restrictions in uh, flagging and moderating content, we also face an issue of uh, student groups and other um, individuals trying to help in this space and counter messaging, having their content taken down. Um, so uh, two days ago, our domestic winners um, of peer to peer, um, they had, uh, they were telling me they had their iOS and Android uh, application they put on their store taken down within two days because they had the use of a Confederate flag. They had created a game um, that teaches um, individuals as bystanders in these situations what signs to look for and um, potentially how, how they can really leverage some of their community resources um, to help. So I, I wanted to open up um, the panel and really discussing um, this issue of content moderation. Um, you know, what policy should be in place? Um, is, there, is there a clear solution ahead? I mean, I can have a first crack at it. Um, so on, just on generally on counter messaging, I know about the P2P network, and uh, uh, I know a few people involved in it, and it's a very worthwhile endeavor. In general, this idea of counter-messaging and the redirect model um, are all certainly worth pursuing. But I, I will say, and uh, this is linked to this issue of the, the causal connection that is often erroneously made between using the internet and becoming radicalized. It, that, that causal connection isn't clear. And even and the way we implement counter-messaging is assuming a couple of things that we're not sure about yet. So 
One is how to, the problem with any of this counter stuff that we may just have to accept is gauging the success of it's very, very hard. So with the redirect model, all we know is how many people are being redirected. We don't know how many of them are being actually impacted. And this, when I say this is linked to the question of the causal connection. So on the whole, despite what, everything I said about social media, the, the general rule is people are not radicalized solely online. It's, it's quite rare. Um, it happens. There are plenty of, of obvious exceptions. Um, though if we look, say, at the, 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 the London attacks uh, on the London Bridge, the guys involved, particularly uh, Karam, Karam Bhatt, were long time involved in extremist physical networks. Um, so the question is why, when people go online, you know, you don't generally, you can fall into this stuff and find it, but you usually look for it in the first place. And you go with a pre-existing set of ideas that you then go and look to confirm online. So if you then are, if, you, if we were to accept that that's generally how it works, that people go online in search of specific things and can find them, um, they're already inoculated, as it were, or immune, in my, in my view, to a lot of the counter stuff. So the counter stuff will come up and they say, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is part of the conspiracy. I mean, why the hell should I believe this? Um, so we're dealing in many cases with people who have already made their mind up um, and are just looking to inject themselves into an echo chamber, are not looking for debate or discussion, let alone counter speech. So I think that it's worth it. It's very important to do. Um, I'm a supporter of it, and I'm glad that the tech companies are doing it. Uh, and I'm sure there are cases where it has worked, but it's very hard to prove. Uh, and we have to know that we're dealing with people who've, who, in many cases, have already made their mind up. They're not um, sort of searching around. Yes, there are cases where that happens, but um, it assumes a lot of things that are not, we haven't been able to really confirm yet. So that's what I would say on that. No, that's a, that's a terrific point. Um, and to transition into that, um, you know, CVE online is an incredibly complicated space, space really requiring partnerships of industry, of think tanks, of researchers, um, of, of local government. Um, so um, I wanted to really um, ask, ask this panel, what are the biggest challenges today that we haven't been able to tackle? Um, and, and what are some things that we can do? Um, in, in the US, uh, we recently announced just a month ago um, through Secretary Kelly, um, in the Office, of, uh, Office for Community Partnerships, $10 million in grants to empower our local uh, partners. Um, of, of this grant program, um, there are three grant winners that are focused on specifically countering the narrative. Um, so I wanted to, um, and that's one solution that the federal government has adopted is really local, working with local practitioners and local partners and NGOs that know their communities incredibly well. Um, internationally, we have uh, the Global Engagement Center at the State Department um, really looking at this uh, from overseas. Um, but I, I wanted to hear about um, what, what we think we can do in this space that has not yet been done um, and why it's, it's complicated and challenging. Well, I mean, kind of tag on to what the good doctor said when it comes to counter messaging. I, I don't know what will work. I do know what doesn't work. Um, you know, we have done this in the United States over and over and over again. The war on drugs motto, you know, don't do drugs, um, didn't work. Uh, we had, you know, we had the exact same kind of mantra when it came to Al Qaeda after 9-11, you know, don't be a terrorist. Uh, I don't know how, how well that worked, but I mean, really these are like, you know, the high school gym teacher telling his class of 17 year olds not to have sex. That doesn't work. Um, it really, it, it, the counter messaging has to come from a legitimate, base, a legitimate group. You know, you have the State Department Think Again, Turn Away program that I looked at. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I kind of laughed. I thought it was funny. Um, it was, you know, people uh, just basically saying, don't be a terrorist. Um, I'm being a little bit um, facetious, but that's kind of what it was. So if you look at some of the, the uh, in, at least in the criminal justice world where I work, some of the counter messaging that actually is effective are using individuals who have been in the system to talk about the true dangers of it. Uh, those, that works. Um, we have the same type of uh, programming at the VA when it comes to suicide and veterans, actual veterans talking to other veterans. So as far as counter messaging and uh, what works, I, I'm not a psychologist, I don't really know, but I do know that the you know, white guy on a webcam telling people not to be terrorists um, isn't, one isn't being watched by terrorists, and if it is, they're laughing at it. Um, that's my two cents. So, 
So let me add, if I may, uh, to a couple of the points you raised. And I think you, you asked firstly about what sort of rules and procedures and so on could be in place. And I think in, in many cases, those, those, are, those rules and procedures are there. They are um, con contained in countries' national laws, which, you know, differ. And, uh, you know, some countries' laws uh, differ slightly in regards to hate speech for, for historical reasons, um, which, you know, us will understand. Um, and they exist also in the company's own terms and conditions about what's acceptable on the platform that people sign up to. So in, I don't, um, so I, you know, in many, most cases, I think it's about implementing those rules are there. And certainly when we ask for material to be taken down, um, that's because we've assessed it, it breaches, it's illegal, and it breaches a company's terms and conditions. Um, but in, in terms of where our ambition and what is hard, I mean, I think uh, groups like ISIL and Daesh, the sort of vicious death cults that they are, we should have an ambition to drive them off the open internet altogether. Um, and I think that is a, uh, like a, perfectly, a perfectly reasonable ambition. Uh, and I think that it's, it's, um, there are lots of things we need to do. I think it is a whole of society problem. Um, but I think there is, there is, uh, there is scope for uh, technology to be able to do more to identify material quicker or even at the point of up uploading and with a, enough confidence to actually stop um, terrorist propaganda going up in the first place. Um, but let me just say I'd like a brief uh, quick defense of governments being involved in counter messaging work because I also agree that that's important. Uh, no doubt, you know, it can be, uh, you know, it can be. Uh, there's ways not to do it, but certainly in the UK, we've, um, we've invested quite a lot in this and we've been doing it for quite a while. Uh, we set up a unit in 2007 um, that, uh, that works with community groups and industry to help them. It's essentially a government uh, strategic communications unit. I think it's a little bit different to the model here in the US because uh, they, are, they are able to work slightly more discreetly. Um, and they do support the delivery of communications to raise awareness, reduce vulnerability, um, and really those community groups in the UK that, that exist and want to get their message out, uh, it sort of helps them, helps uh, build their capacity, helps sort of match them with uh, industry and support they need. And we think that those, uh, those, those campaigns have been successful. Um, this is, I mean, there's, Vicky was quite a lot in the news um, recently. Uh, because the, there were a number of articles uh, suggesting it was a, a, a sort of government propaganda uh, machine. But actually, I think that that died down pretty quickly um, when there was a pretty strong reaction. Actually, many of the groups that, that Ricky worked with reacted pretty strongly at the suggestion that they were sort of mere mouthpieces for government and, and spoke out about the importance that it was their message. And quite right, the government should be helping them. And the public response in general was, I think, pretty glad that the government is doing this sort of work because, because it is important. So if, if I could um, make two suggestions, two things that, that would help. Um, uh, one, and this, this may be surprising, um, the, the, uh, the statements from various government leaders um, urging technology companies to do more, um, that's actually helpful. Uh, it, it, it continues to keep the issue front and center within the companies, uh, and as companies adjust their resources to problems that need to be addressed, uh, it, uh, it strengthens those voices within the companies who want to take uh, more and continue efforts in, in this area. Uh, I think that urging um, the companies to live up to their social responsibilities is an important role uh, for government officials to play. European Council did that recently with their statement, the G7, um, uh, had a statement recently that uh, had a, a similar uh, impact. Uh, so that's one thing that can help. Now, the second is uh, don't give up on technology. I mean, these, these are smart coders in these companies, and there, there, there are many ways in which they might be able to use uh, clever machine learning algorithms to improve the process of identifying uh, bad stuff. They're, they're doing that in the area uh, of fake news, um, you know, creating algorithms that with, with some high likelihood will identify um, alleged pieces of news as probably fake news. What that does is, is, um, is find material and, and give it priority for human review. I don't think you'll ever get to the point where the technology will automate a takedown, uh, but I think we can do better on, on the technology. Uh, and so I think there's some, some progress that can be made there. 
Um, I can tell you what won't work, uh, which is government mandates uh, in, in the area. We, we have uh, the new German law, uh, which uh, imposes fines of uh, 50 million euros uh, if um, uh, a, a piece of material that has been complained about isn't taken down within 24 hours. They give you seven days if it's disputed material, but uh, it's still a, a pretty hefty fine at the end of it. Um, and uh, I know um, uh, May and Macron are talking about uh, imposing liability um, constraints on, on the, the companies as well. Um, that, that's the wrong direction. It, it really won't help. Um, it, it moves the issues from an operational mode where the company officials can work with government to try to find common solutions to a problem uh, into a compliance mode where, where, where people are saying, what do I need to do now to avoid a $50 million fine? Um, and at the end of the day, what it'll, it'll wind up doing is taking more material down that should not be taken down. You'll see more examples of counter-terrorist speech coming down because it's got the kind of thing in it that would uh, might trigger a, a flag that would uh, would create a fine if it if it is enacted upon. Uh, so I, I think um, government pressure, government urging, government focus on the issue, very very helpful. Government mandates, very counterproductive. Now, that, that's a terrific great. Alex, go ahead. Sorry. I'll just touch on a couple of things that, that were talked about here. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning there's a couple of, I think, rather difficult and perhaps intractable problems. Uh, and I don't envy um, the, the tech companies because they, they've got some, some issues that are hard to deal with. And I bet, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg set up Facebook, I doubt he saw himself sitting in, you know, DHS meetings talking about, you know, the fact that the glo global terrorist groups are using, I mean, this is, this is, they didn't see this coming, and I don't blame them for it. Um, the other problem, we keep talking about the content. Uh, we talk very briefly about what that content actually entails. When you hear that, you often think, oh, yeah, all those beheading videos, all those really openly ISIS propaganda. That's not what's always radicalizing these people. Um, most, a lot of the stuff, so two, two names, one you mentioned, Anwar Awlaki, uh, I wrote my PhD on him, and, and Ahmed Musa Jibril is another major name, right? These are the two big English-speaking names that come up uh, when they talk about sheikhs who inspired, uh, you know, or helped radicalize people. Their stuff is still, and this is not a critic, I'll frame this by saying I'm not criticizing YouTube for this. Their stuff is still all over YouTube. Uh, and there's a reason why. Because the vast majority of what they're saying is not even close to illegal or even close to inciting direct violence. And in fact, probably doesn't meet the threshold for, um, for being taken down, technically. Um, I've listened to every single thing Ahmed Musa Jibril and Awlaki have said, and 99% of it um, really can help radicalize people, but is not, on the face of it, illegal or even close to it. Justifications, religious justifications for the establishment of Sharia law, using violence um, in, in a general sense, um, presenting Islam as this global political ideology that is set to uh, replace uh, the liberal democratic world order, um, and justifying all that using their interpretation of the religion. You know, this is stuff that is not very easy to identify as being radicalizing, is not um, direct incitement to violence uh, in most cases. Now, the later stuff Awlaki said was more clearly violent, but plenty, most of the stuff that's most popular of his is, is not at all um, direct incitement to violence. And that is, you know, I don't know what you can really do about that. Awlaki has developed, for example, the, the most clear justification for killing people who draw cartoons of, of Muhammad without once telling you to do it. Uh, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you, uh, you, can, you, can, you can listen to the lecture uh, when we come out of this meeting today. And he, he provides it pretty convincingly using his interpretation of the uh, core Islamic text. And this also comes to the issue of not talking enough about ideology and the role of certain interpretations of religion in radicalizing people. And, and that I, f I find too many people are too scared to talk enough about in a serious way because of understandable issues of uh, trying to avoid people feeling persecuted. Obviously, that's not what we're trying to do here. But let's get real and realize that we're talking about guys who are seen as legitimate uh, Islamic voices who are presenting an interpretation of the religion that is very hard to present as illegal. Um, and I think we need to, re it's not just that beheading stuff and all those ISIS fancy videos. It's much more deep than that. Uh, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But that's a big problem. I don't know, I'm not sure there's a huge amount that can be done. That's why I keep saying the limits of what we can do, we have to consider as well and just accept that there's not always a solution. No, absolutely. Um, as Alex said, 
a lot of these groups are, are some of the most experienced digital marketers you can imagine. Um, really, you know, a lot of softer content that leads to some of the violent ones that attract a lot more, more views and attention, but um, they really are winning this war as a consequence of quantity. Um, and to add to what Arthur, Mark, um, and Kevin have uh, previously said on um, this issue of um, what government is doing and an amount of moderation. Um, I wanted to turn it back to the U.S. and, and talk about uh, the First Amendment and um, your guys' thoughts here in terms of um, how this online messaging really plays into individual rights. Um, and I'm, I'm also watching time here, so we'll wrap it up shortly for um, some Q&A from the, cl from the crowd. Um, but I wanted to give everyone a chance to speak on this. I'll be um, really brief. I mean, I think it's really important that we don't have a Pyrrhic victory when it comes to this discussion. Uh, the, everything that we've talked about today um, is going to run up against a very hard wall called the First Amendment. And there's also some Fourth Amendment applications as well. But you know, in reality, we do have pretty clear doctrine about what is hate speech and what is not. I mean, it has to present a clear and present danger in order for the government to be able to step in. And I'm not talking about what tech companies can do. A tech company can decide to do um, what it wants. It's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about when the government mandates. And we have a history of abuse. Um, with all due respect to our brothers and sisters across the pond, but a lot of our First Amendment history comes from uh, the British rule, and even the very, very, very first rule in 1789, the Sedition Act, which was designed to prevent the British from coming in and subjugating um, our, our people again through uh, propaganda, um, was never ever used against the British. It was used against Jefferson's party, against the Fed, uh, from the Federalist Party, in order to uh, quell uh, political speech. So there is a very hard wall here, and you know, it, it, this is not. We're not talking about running in a movie theater and yelling fire. And when people say, well, this is like child pornography, no, it's not. No, it's not. And it's, it's a false equivalent. Or when, you know, last month there was a ISIS flag posted on a, a dam, and people were saying, well, this is the same thing as a Confederate flag um, being posted. Well, that's not true either, because, you know, reenactors from the Civil War aren't, you know, threatening our way of life. Um, but ISIS is. So I think that it's really important that, 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 you know, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you there is a hard wall there. And um, I, I really respect the, the British position, but they don't have the same, you know, uh, limitations that we do. They don't have the same government, and they don't have the same way of looking at the interaction between the government and the, the people. We start off with suspicion of government. Uh, they don't. And so I think those are important things to, to factor in. No, that's great. I mean, and, and I think that's been really challenging, particularly domestically, is um, government has a really hard role in this space uh, due to the First Amendment um, in, in being able to really act itself um, to do counter messaging. Um, so we're not able to do um, similar programs like uh, the one that uh, Kevin had mentioned with Riku, but you know, there are other measures we can really do in, in working with the tech sector to empower our, our community partners. Um, but um, I guess the last, last question for all of you guys, um, for those in the room, um, what, can, what do you think Congress should do in this space and um, what can they do? Is there? I feel you're the legal scholar, I feel. Maybe I'll pass it to you again. <laughs> I, I, no. Sorry, but not a lot. I think this is something for private industry. This is a societal thing, and I hate being a cliche and say it's about culture, but it is about culture, and I, I think that um, this is a brave new world that we live in, and we do not want to sacrifice our freedom for safety, but at the same time, you know, it's very easy to, to say things like that. Um, but the Constitution doesn't mean anything in the shadow of a mushroom cloud. And I think that these are the balances that, that, that decision makers have to make. And so what can Congress do? I don't know what Congress really can do. I think there's some Fourth Amendment things that we can get into, but we're out of time. I think there's some very real Fourth Amendment issues that we can get into with ECPA and, um, and backdooring and things like that that we can talk about. And they can have some impact there. But the First Amendment is a bright line, and I, we do not want to, you know, you know, Eric Polzer from University of Chicago has been writing about this. We don't want less light on the freedom of speech. We want more light. And I'm not saying that we, we need more speech is going to fix this. Um, I'm saying that this is really an issue for industry, um, and the government should be helping, but not mandating.
Yeah, I think the, I think the Congress and, and generally the government can use its connections and its sway to connect the right people. Um, so, you know, in the case of, of the jihadists, you have people who've devoted their entire, they've thrown everything away to create propaganda online for ISIS or for Al-Qaeda or whatever. These guys have, they've dropped everything for this. This is their life, it's their career, they've left their families, everything. They, and we don't have the alternative side doing that because your average you know, person who, who can provide the alternative has a life to live, has a career, to, has a family to feed, has a, you know, being a decent human being to get along with doing. Um, so create, making that a full-time job um, perhaps can be useful, again, not through the government, but maybe the government can look at how it can connect all the people it, it knows, so from the philanthropists and the entrepreneurs, uh, and making sure they get in the right room together and come up with, so I think being a forum, beyond that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, you can radicalize someone without breaking any laws here or actually in, in, in Europe where you have less codified free speech. You can still, you can get a lot done without directly calling for violence. You really, really can. So, um, three things. Um, one, uh, this convening function uh, I, I think is very important. The government can bring all the appropriate parties together in a room and say, okay, guys, what, what, what's going on here? Uh, let's work together. Uh, and I think not just once or twice, but sort of on a regular basis. Uh, I do think, as I said before, um, keeping up the pressure on tech companies through statements encouraging companies to do more and, and frankly, congratulating them when they do something right. Uh, that, that, that's helpful. Uh, but then the third thing is, um, you know, th there is a crying need for studies in this area, for, for analysis, for, uh, for people to think about issues and try to determine the best way to uh, take steps against uh, uh, these guys. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with the government funding programs like that. Uh, and if, if the government uh, can um, give money out through the National Science Foundation for artificial intelligence research, they should be able to give money out to focus on this issue, this issue and try to do something more positive about it. So those three areas, uh, uh, convening, uh, you know, keeping up the bully pulpit, um, and some funding uh, might be positive areas where the government could act. So very briefly, Arthur brings up the um the Revolutionary War and independence from Britain. And so, I mean, in that spirit, I wouldn't uh, presume to suggest what Congress should or, or shouldn't, be, shouldn't be doing. Um, but, uh, I mean, I would say, I, I mean, I agree with what much has been said. I mean, for us, this is a really, you know, top issue. Um, it's one of the highest priorities of the, of the British government. Um, and so we think it really needs, a, you know, a really uh, major focus. And of course, we have a huge respect for for Congress as a sort of public forum grappling with the most important issues uh, of of the day. I also think there's also a kinetic solution that we don't talk about, and that may has may have caused much of the you know radicalization. But there is a place for the military to go out and kill bad guys, um, and that is a a function of the government and something that we we don't look at all the time. And it's you know when I say things like that, people are always like, oh my gosh, no, sometimes bad guys need to be killed. Um, and maybe that has caused some of the problems that we're facing, but that is a role, a clear role for the government. Um, 82nd Airborne Division is really efficient at killing bad guys. So that might be something we, we think about as well. No, absolutely. Um, so first off, um, I'm watching the time. I know if some of you guys have 1, 1 p.m.s, I, I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Um, but I want to wrap it off by saying, you know, um, it, it's, it's been tremendous just having the support of, of Congress and funding teams like the CVE Task Force, the DHS Office for Community Partnerships, and um, continuous funding to really convene um, forms like this to um, to allow for collaboration with with all parts of uh, private sector, NGOs, industry. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hands. Yes. Um, well, we have seen one change, which is a, a pretty, pretty major decline in their activity online. 
um, <clears throat> partly to do with what internet companies are doing, partly to do with the, the, the degrading of their physical uh, um, presence. Um, so when I mentioned the, uh, the virtual entrepreneurs that, who are using encryption, uh, encryption to plot attacks here, one of the things that we saw in one of the US cases was a guy who had reached out originally asking for help to travel. And the response was, no, you know, actually, you're in a much, you're where we want to be. You're behind enemy lines. There's no point in you coming over here. You, you should do something over there. So it's not just in the, in the, the messaging they're putting out, but in the actual directions uh, they're giving. Um, as far, I think now you're seeing, you're seeing much more discussion about how, um, you know, they can survive, that they're not really just about the state. They can survive beyond uh, their physical existence. Um, in the end, ISIS is just part of a global social movement in the, that is the global jihad movement. It's the current, uh, you know, spearhead of it. But the point is it, it's going to continue to exist in some form or other, uh, move towards a, a more traditional insurgency. Uh, so I think more discussion now about, yes, we're, we can survive this. The, you know, we have, our victory has already been prophesied. So, you know, this is just a hiccup. Um, but, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've seen a sort of substantive shift, really, no. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? So just to speak from the UK uh, perspective, so when we talk about taking down uh, extremist material and indeed our wider program, uh, we're talking about all forms of extremism, not just um, Islamist extremism. And I think around 70% uh, or so of the material request taken down is Islamist extremism, but um, you know, a, a significant proportion of what we're doing is other forms of extremism as well. Yeah, and it's the same response in the U.S. We work with all types of extremist groups, not just um, ISIS, ISIL-inspired extremism. Yeah, and I mean, the far right were the first to really, in America, were the first to really use the internet, actually, before jihadists. They were doing it when, when it was kind of, uh, in the 80s, when it was just these kind of weird message boards that were, um, that, was, that was the far right using it. Stormfront is the main uh, uh, neo-Nazi, white supremacist forum in the world, in the English language, is based here, um, and uh, uh, I think its servers are in the U.S. Um, so a very similar problem, of course, uh, without a doubt. You know, it's, it's fascinating. I think a lot of these groups are really almost learning from each other. Um, it, it doesn't matter what extremist group we're tackling in online space. Um, they're, they're using channels, it started off being web forums, websites, um, transitioning to social media. Now we're really seeing the trend moving towards encrypted channels and, and really uh, disappearing in the online space while, while staying online. So um, I, think, I think there are tons of parallels to draw. And every group is different in their methodology and their teachings, but they're definitely leveraging technology in, in very similar ways to disseminate their information and radicalize to recruit. Yes?
<laughs> Kevin, do you want to take that or? Uh, well, not really. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. You're asking you're asking questions at level expertise. I don't really have, but. Um, uh, you know, if you want, if you want to get in touch, I mean, we have we have other people in in Turkey. You said this is supported by UK government. Um, you know, be interested in following up. But I don't have I don't have anything really useful to say, to be honest. I mean, likewise, um, there is a lot to say on it. And really, what you're asking for is help with a, a methodology of, of researching this, uh, which again probably is better done via you know email or something. Um, though this issue of root causes. Uh, sure what, what you mean by it exactly, but generally this is the idea of these sort of the, the external factors that are pushing people towards, I mean, those depend on where you are. Uh, you talked about this already, the Sunni uh, um, repression in, 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 in Iraq by the Shia government, but more so, I mean, look, it, this is the other thing. Why a guy in Syria right now is joining ISIS is not too, in my view, that complicated. He is, if, he's a, uh, if he's not an Alawi or, or, or any type of Shia, he's joining because in many cases that's really a survival mechanism. They are, they are facing one of the most atrocious um, uh, uh, oh, near genocides that are currently taking place in the world. Uh, and ISIS is unfortunately the only game in town. Uh, if we look at recent policy decisions that have been made to help that go ahead, I think, um, ISIS is the only effectively against what is a horrific uh, um, crime taking place in Syria by being carried out by the uh, Alawi um, uh, Assad regime. So there it's not a big mystery. Why some middle class kid from, from you know, the Midwest in America decides to join that group is a far more difficult question to ask uh, and, and root causes maybe less of a relevant thing. And you know, grievances and all this stuff, you know, they exist all over the world. Poverty is, is ubiquitous. All types of grievances are terrorism is not. Um, so the, I wouldn't. I would try to avoid the idea that people join terrorist groups simply because of these root causes. But actually, in, in, in Syria, in many cases, it's pretty. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's not as complicated as it is here. Um, but it's it's a, that's a big. It's a big question. Uh, those are just a couple of thoughts. Great. Thank you. And and you're welcome to also follow up with me. Um, I can connect you with some of our colleagues at State Department that have been working uh, around this issue. So, so um, thank you so much for today. I'm looking at the time. And um, if you guys have questions, don't hesitate to come up and, and ask the panelists. It's great to meet you. Yeah.